Also, willkommen in der... Welcome to the Heinrich Böll Foundation. I'm very happy that you have decided to join our events, Egypt's Human Rights Crisis, U uh, Europe's Responsibility. I'm Bauke Baumann, and I work here at the Bell Foundation. A couple of hours ago, Chancellor Merkel has received the Egyptian president, al Sisi, in the chancellery. He will attend the G20 summit on Africa in Berlin. I do not know what they have talked about, but I hope they've talked about human rights as well. Tonight, we are going to focus on the development of the human rights situation in Egypt, and we are going to have a discussion about what it means for Germany, for Europe, what we can do in order to improve the situation on the ground. As the Bell Foundation, we are no longer present in Egypt. We had to stop our activity in Egypt. The reason for that was the repressions against our partners in Egypt. We found it was impossible to carry out a meaningful human rights activity on the ground. And uh, in Germany, it gets more and more difficult for us to work in the context of Egypt. It's uh, very difficult to invite critical Egyptian uh, activists for public meetings because many of them are afraid. They are afraid of repressions uh, for themselves or their families. They are afraid of no longer being allowed to travel to Egypt. And that's really a very difficult development. I'm very happy that tonight we managed to get together a very interesting panel of uh, experts. And I'm handing over to Fiona Elias, who is going to be our host tonight. She is the foreign news desk editor at The Spiegel. I also would like to thank you for coming here. I'm very happy to uh, give a few introductory words. Let me start with a quotation. Together, we are going to develop a civilized, a modern state that is going to uphold the values of democracy and liberty. Uh, you have to make a guess who said that. It's uh, President Al-Sisi who is in Berlin at the moment, he said that one and a half years ago, that was a speech he made on TV on the occasion of the anniversary of uh, the revolution. We know he never kept his promise. Tonight, we're going to discuss what happened to Egypt and what the situation is at the moment ever since al -Sisi came to power. Was it indeed a second revolution? Uh, or was it a coup d'etat? So we are going to speak about how come that Egypt is currently undergoing the most severe human rights crisis. The uh, reason why we have this event tonight is uh, that al is attending the Africa conference of the G20. Probably they are not going to dis criticize him much. We have a normalization of official relations. Uh, the much disputed NGO law has been signed, and it will be more and more difficult for human rights activists uh, to work in Egypt. We can criticize, and of course we are going to do that tonight. And we are going to have a discussion tonight with two Egyptians who live in exile. And we also have invited two experts from Germany. So we'd like to look at the current situation as far as human rights are concerned. Tonight, we have no direct voices from the country, as we said. And we have no single woman. I'm just the host, so I don't count as a woman tonight. And I am not an expert in Egypt, so we have four experts here, but all of them are men. We want to invite a lady as well, but she had to cancel her participation. She said she's afraid, and she fears that her family will be in danger. A couple of words about the current political realities for all of you who are not uh, well versed in Egyptian affairs. It is a country that is being governed by a former uh, military man and a minister of defense, and uh, he has 
adopted so-called security laws that limits uh, the freedom of assembly and opinion always in the name of uh, combat against terror. Organizations such as the Muslim Brotherhood is prohibited, uh, dissidents are in prison. We can talk about numbers later. The power of the Arab, Arab Springs has uh, worn off only 2% instead of uh, attended the uh, election. Officially, they said it was 27%. The people are, as people say, either indifferent or paranoid. And the symbol of Aziz's uh, style of leadership is not just the handshake with the Merkel. He is much more focused, for instance, on uh, Trump's uh, sable dance uh, during the uh, summit. And he would like to build a kind of uh, desert city like we have it in Dubai. We are looking forward to have the discussion with Mohammed Sultan. You are 29 years old, is that right? He grew up in Ohio, was arrested in the of his father, who is a famous Muslim brother. For 21 months, he was in an Egyptian prison and went into a hun hunger strike. And that hunger strike maybe was his uh, rescue, and he was able to go to the United States. Uh, Mohammed Sultan. Uh, Although he was ill, managed to come here. It is wonderful. Ahmed, Dr. Ahmed Said is 33 years old. He's a physician. He has no famous father, but he has a sister who is sitting in the first row. She just arrived from Washington. And uh, Dr. Said's wife is here as well. You prepared for a wedding in Cairo, and you were arrested uh, for having participated in an unauthorized demonstration for 18 months. You were in prison. That is one example for the repressions of the justice system in Egypt. To my left, we have Wolfgang Büttner. He works for Human Rights Watch in Berlin. They published a report on the human rights situation in the prisons. And we'd like to talk about that report. And also, we'd like to talk about uh, the exchange of opinion with the federal government. Then we also have Stefan Roll. He comes from the German Institute of Foreign in International Relations. And he is going to speak about why the signing of the security agreement was uh, the wrong decision and what will that mean for political relations between Germany and Egypt. And I'm going to start with Mohammed Sultan. I'm a journalist myself, and that is why I can say he traveled from far away in order to tell us an interesting and moving city. Ever since your childhood, you've been living in Ohio, and now you're living there again. And because your father wasn't there, you were arrested. How come you were arrested? What was the story behind that? Following the uh, 2013 violent dispersal of the uh, Rabah sit-in that was protesting the uh, military coup, um, there was a, a general crackdown that over 60,000 political prisoners had become victims of. I had no idea where to go in Cairo. I uh, took refuge in the only place I called home, which is my father's uh, home in the suburb of uh, Maadi. And uh, the security forces came looking for my father and uh, I was arrested and I was imprisoned. I was sentenced to life in prison um, f on journalism related charges. They were the same charges that um, the Al Jazeera staff were charged with and it was spreading false information to shake the grandeur of the state. Uh, throughout my imprisonment, um, just really quickly, before I, I, I get into Usually when I tell my story, people want to hear about, you know, the torture, the hard physical torture um, that happens in some of these prisons. And I'm going to give you a, a little preview and just, um, I, I don't like talking about the physical torture as much because 
the the physical torture, physical pain goes away. So you get hurt, and a few hours later, if it's really bad, if you break something, a few months later, and the pain goes away. But the psychological pain, um, that stays with you, it, and, and it sticks through. I mean, just last week, I um, fell asleep on my sister's couch in D.C., and I had a nightmare. I had a nightmare that I was like my friends uh, that I got to know in prison was sentenced to uh, death. And I had a dream that I was walking up so that I can get hanged. And the, 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 the nightmare continued all the way until the rope was around my neck. And at the same time that the rope was tightening, my sister had apparently been trying to take my tie off so that I can get comfortable sleep. So I woke up frantically and I pulled her away, pulled my, 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 uh, my tie away. That's just one, you know, remnants of, of what sticks through with you. I, I still wake up in the middle of the night to just shaking keys. Imagine that you're just sleeping and just shaking keys because you're afraid the guards are going to come in and, and search you and beat you. And every person that has been in prison will tell you that. Every person that has been imprisoned in Egypt's dungeons will tell you that even waking up, sometimes I'm still afraid to sleep. Just imagine. People are afraid to sleep because, you know, when you're in prison, uh, you're, su you're, you're in such a dark and horrible place. And you fall asleep and you dream about being with your friends and living your life, traveling, going everywhere you want to be, being with your loved ones. And then you wake up and, you know, in the morning there's that, like, time when the, you're half awake, half asleep. And you're thinking, you know, is this my reality? And it starts to sink in that this dark place with no windows, this place that's closed off, this four and a half by five meters with 21 people where you get, you know, we call it a, 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 a abdon and, and uh, what's it called? Chip. This, this, is, this is how much you get space in prison. This. So you have to literally sleep on your side. And that becomes your reality. So when you wake up to that every single morning after you leave, and I'm sure Dr. Ahmed will tell you here that sometimes you're afraid to sleep so that you're afraid that you this is just all a dream, that you'll wake up being in that same dungeon that you were. And that's just, and, and you know, I'll get into, I don't want to take up a lot of the time, but that's not talking about the beatings. That's not talking about the, 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 the cigarette scars that I still have on the back of my neck. That's not talking about the impromptu surgery that I was forced to have because with no anesthesia and no sterilization because I needed to get metal plates that were in my arm due to surgery out of my arm before I bleed to death. Eine ganz kleine Unterbrechung. Was bedeutet es, wenn Sie in der Einzelzelle dann Rasierklingen und What does it mean if you're in single confinement, solitary confinement and they put razor blades into your cell? What does that mean? Why did they do that? of my imprisonment after there was a wave of hunger strikes the Egyptian authorities decided that they need to completely isolate me um, they put me in a de they designated an entire building for me and they started a systematic psychological torture and this is what I'm talking about this is what uh, uh, it's the residue from those last six months where um, there was an incitement to commit suicide there was a um, constant, uh, you know, again, inciting, telling me, hey, just end this, make this easy for you and us. They would, and they would throw, I mean, just imagine being in a place where you literally cannot, where there's sound control. You cannot hear any other sounds around you. There's no movement. It's not like, it's worse. It's the next level of solitary confinement where there is light control. There's flashing lights for 36 hours where you fall into a, a uh, it, when you go into a seizure, where you fall into a coma, um, where they, they let the guards slide me, uh, uh, blades from under the door, and then they tell you, hey, you need to cut vertically and not horizontally so you can make this faster, where they throw in another inmate, Rida, into the room, 
and basically uh, uh, almost someone who's almost dead and they they say take care of him and they let him die in your room in your cell so and then they blame you they come in why did you uh why did you let him die why did you let him die and you know you know they're messing with you they you know that these are psychological torture tactics that they're trying to to uh, uh, pressure you with but at the end of the day there's someone that died somebody died in a, a two and a half meter space by two meters somebody died in a room with you and you couldn't do anything about it because the guards just let him die um, es gefällt, fällt mir sehr schwer sie zu unterbrechen it's very difficult to interrupt you but let me ask you anyway You talked about uh, the dangers for life and limb, but you have also said that it is also dangerous. And you have said that there is radicalization in the prison situation, the Islamists, the liberals, the political prisoners, the guards uh, were all hating the West and America. So what was the most absurd situation that uh, you were confronted with? What were the most absurd statements made by people around you? March 16, 2015, my father, who's a deputy minister of uh, Islamic endowment, one of my friends, Omar Malik, and 11 other, 12 other people on journalism-related charges got sentenced to death. The, the, the human part where no kid should ever see his father in a state of weakness where he is unjustly sentenced to death, nobody should ever have to go through that. No, sh nobody should ever have to go through seeing his friend again on trumped up charges getting sentenced to death and have him scream your name from across the cage. Nobody should ever have to go through that. That wasn't the most absurd part of the night. The most absurd part of that day, and it's the second worst day of my life, was on that same transport car back and on with the same judge, there was, and I kid you not, and I hate being stereotypical here, a, um, a member of, you know, according to him, the Islamic State, and a black turban, long hair, uh, inmate was let go was released on bail in the same transport car back that my father my journalist friend and my other friend who's an entrepreneur and 11 others unjustly got sentenced to death for being political opposition that was honestly I have never been as confused in my life as that moment to me when this man walked up to the judge and corrected the judge when he told him, so you pledged allegiance to Daesh, and he said, no, to the Islamic State. That man got let go that day. And we had to still, until today, families of 14 other people had to deal with the pain that comes with a death sentence. That's, that's not okay. And today, I mean, and, and Dr. Ahmed will talk about this more, you know, just a few days ago, six teenagers got from military court got sentenced to death and their families right before this right before coming into this 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 hall their families calling and texting and saying what can we do anything that's not okay because it's easy to sit here and talk about numbers people like it, it's very easy to sit here and say there's 40 50 60 thousand political prisoners that are in there it's easy to say there's this many death sentences, this many life sentences, and this many years that, are, are, that, that people have been sentenced to. But every single one of those numbers has a story behind it. Every single one is a brother, a, a, a father, a son, a, a relative, a friend of somebody. And it's not just, it doesn't just affect that person, but it affects everybody around them. So yes, that's, that's the most absurd a, a, a moment in in in, uh, in my time in prison, but that's not you know, um, it's it's a simple it's a simple statement. It's a simple statement when you have an influx of news, 
for the pro-democracy camp, uh, whether it's from the Islamists to the, the, uh, the secular uh, activists. Everybody across the spectrum, that democracy, the believers in democracy, they have an influx of news, of superpowers, right? The United States of America, Germany, uh, you know, the, the world is accepting this and, and, and giving this man, as we speak now, giving him an international platform. Mm -hmm. This man that's oppressing thousands and thousands of people. And, you know, there's this acceptance of him, there is this coddling of him. But then on the other hand, so there's influx of, you know, the Western world abandoning its values, abandoning its core principles. And then you have the other camp, the, you know, whether it's Al-Qaeda or the Islamic State, they have an influx of news to what they perceive as positive news, right? As, you know, there's expansions here, there's the Italian consulate in the heart of Cairo is being bombed, there is the church in Tanta, there is Alexandria Church, there is, there is tons and tons of expansions in what they call. In Sinai, on the eastern border with Libya, in Iraq, in Syria, and they see all of that. And so it, it, to them, it, the, the idea becomes, it becomes more, an, the argument becomes simpler and simpler to make to disenfranchised youth who feel very abandoned by the world. This is why this is extremely important. Don't think that by you coming, you're not doing anything. By you hearing you know, what this panel has to say. People on this stage and you coming out here, you're giving voice to those people, people that you might not ever meet in your life. I know when I was in there, and this is when I, when I met President Obama, this is what I told him. I said, when I was in there, when I was in prison, you're around terrible people, you're around torturers, you're around pathological liars, and you start to think that this is your world, that this is existence, and you start to think that no other world exists, and then you find out that there's somebody, somebody who's never met you and probably will never meet you in your life, is advocating on your behalf. Was And that becomes a ray of hope. Was glauben Sie hat sie aus dem Gefängnis? What do you think has uh, saved you from prison? Was it the hunger strike? Was it the US passport, Kerry? What saved you, Obama? People. People from across the world rallied together. They advocated on my behalf uh, indiscriminately. And they told my story, and they pressured the strongest country on earth to demand my release. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the bottom line. It's people. People have the power. People, n not necessarily in Egypt. We sat there and talked about how hard it is for activists to speak up and get people to speak up. But people outside, we now in this room, have the power. I am literally living proof that every single one of you has the power to make a change in someone's life, to save someone's life. My life was saved because of people. And we are very glad that we have this living proof. Sehr lebendig. Uh, und, uh, um, we're happy that you are here sitting with us as living proof. Uh, I would like to ask Ahmed Said very briefly whether you fully agree um, Was it the people or was it reports about your story, not within you, uh, Egypt, but, for example, in Germany, that uh, saved you from a longer uh, prison time? We're lucky, me and uh, Mohammed, we had the luck that some people know us and talked about us. But there's small thousands in prison still have nobody to talk about them. Nobody know about them, more than 60,000, as Mohammed yeah. said. And uh, before I, I went to prison, I was like, for me, it was here in Germany. It was like I feel all the time guilty because I'm living here safe. And thousands of people are like forced to face all this kind of insanity. And after I, am, after I was in prison and went out now, I feel more guilty. Because I had the luck. I had the people who, has, who have the contacts to the media, to the politicals. So they talked about me. And I spent just one year. And I'm supposed to, to spend two years in prison. 
And uh, I, now I'm, I'm really not sure about my feelings because I, I, I'm so happy to see Muhammad right now here. And really, I, I'm, I'm really so happy. But at the same time, after hearing this again and again and again, I, I'm not sure of my feelings. I, I, don't, I don't know how I feel right now. Because like, I used always when I, I got asked uh, about my case and about my story and about my experience, I always said like, it is not the right time for me now to talk about it. It's not the right time. I didn't work on it. I didn't work on this experience. And it's very hard for me because every time I need to talk about my story, I need also to remember, remember. all the people's stories that I met inside. It's really unbelievable. Like Muhammad uh, speak about the six young guys who have uh, got sentenced to death in Egypt like before two weeks or something like this. And these guys, I, I, I saw I saw them in prison. They were in the same prison where I am. It was like the Scorpion prison, one of the worst prison, the worst prison in Egypt, actually, after Lazuli. And this guy was kidnapped, were kidnapped, these guys. And it's been two months in uh, the uh, Geheimdienst, the uh, Secret Service. Secret, Secret Service, two months in prison, mm -hmm. torture, 24 hours a day. Uh, they told me the story how they how they, how they got tortured. Also, uh, uh, everybody knows how they tortured the people. But to hear this, and uh, then they transport to our prison, to the to prison where I was, and I heard their screams every night, every night, and it was like a torture. It was a, another type of torture, to hear the screams of the people who are, they got tortured and could do nothing. And. After I, I went out of the prison, I knew that the, the people got sentenced to, to, do, to death. And I knew that these people are innocent. These people did nothing. These people were kidnapped before, before even the, like, it's, it's like in the case of the general attorney, it was a, a anyway. They sentenced to death, and I know, and everybody in Egypt know that they are innocent, and we can do nothing. We just watch, talk, discuss, and do nothing. Kein Problem. Herr, Herr Büttner, kommt Ihnen das bekannt? Mr. Büttner, does it sound familiar? Does it remind you of the experience that you gathered in your 25 years Scorpion uh, prison? Is it worse? than before the revolution? Is it worse today? Well, for the single individual, it's always very bad, uh, no matter which uh, regime is in power. Um, when you're tortured, it's always bad. However, the numbers, 60,000, speaks for itself. It's a, a huge number. So obviously, um, this regime is even worse than the Mubarak regime. What's very important for us as human rights organization, Human Rights Watch, or also other organizations uh, like Amnesty, is that we can uh, give those voices a platform also in the foreign policy that uh, the voices of those who have suffered under the regime are being heard by the governments in the foreign ministries, in the chancellery. Uh, in Germany. How does this work concretely if those voices no longer dare to um, voice their views and tell their stories? Well, there are always possibilities to find people who want to tell their story. Now, it does also um, work through the reports that we are uh, drafting, um, where we describe very, in a very detailed way what we have seen also in the Scorpion prison. Um, and we try to um, bring this into the ministries and to see to it that those individual cases are not being forgotten and that foreign policy is not considered something um, detached from those stories, but that it's always about the people um, in the country on the spot and that we can help those um, people in government meetings, etc. So can you still imagine that uh, there are human rights activists within uh, Egypt still? Where are they? 
Well, there are uh, individuals who are in the country um, and I'm f fighting for human rights. However, there are fewer all the time. Most go uh, into exile. They try to um, exert influence from other countries, from Beirut, for example, or from Europe or the United States. So there are fewer. Um, and you also mentioned the NGO law. So what are the challenges, uh, the concrete challenges in the daily work of those activists that, you're, uh, that you know of? Well, what the non-governmental organizations are being faced with if this new law is being implemented is that all activities by NGOs or civil rights organizations are being monitored by a control body which is comprised of Secret Service members, the Foreign and the Interior Ministry, so there will no longer be any independent activities. They might be shut down if they um, <coughs> violate vaguely formulated objectives um, as regards foreign policy or domestic policy, and so their work is completely restricted. And we hope and we mentioned this time and again that Mac uh, today also the foreign ministry uh, in their meetings with CZ will put this on the agenda, will talk about this. At the same time, of course, we know that the priorities are a little bit different. Uh, investments, of course, have a priority uh, today and tomorrow. However, we want to put this high on the agenda. Um, and all, in particular those uh, who have suffered from the regime. This is our main task, and we will put it on the agenda time and again. How about working from exile? What is the worst enemy if you do not suffer from those uh, laws anymore? Question um, directed at you both. What's the biggest uh, foe? Maybe the disinterest? Um, there are too many problems around the world. So is this the case, disinterest? Is this the worst enemy of yours? Uh, the first problem is that um, um, I think it's uh, maybe disinteressant, wie, wie Sie gesagt haben, but uh, I think it's not the, m the, the major problem. I, uh, I think the major problem is that we are living here in a democratic country, but for example, we had uh, this agreement between Germany and, uh, and e Egypt about the security. Uh, cooperation. Im April unterzeichnet. Yeah, and which was signed in April. I made a campaign against this agreement. We talked to the parties, but uh, like the like the government, the German government had like a very very strange argument, like why you are cooperating with a dictatorship in Egypt. Why? Wir haben hier, wir, wir hätten ja gerne auch jemanden von der deutschen Regierung hier, die wir dazu... We would have liked to have a government representative from the German government here today, however they could not come, unfortunately. It's very strange for me, actually, because they said that we are dealing with the dictator to try to make it bitter for the human rights in Egypt. And I don't know how. How, how would they, like, what are the tools that they have to, to make it better with dealing with the dictator, like they supporting him in all ways, and they telling us that they are uh, trying to, uh, like, make it better for the human rights uh, situation in Egypt. Was würden Sie denn erwarten? Was wäre konkret, also, was müsste passieren? Uh, what would you say? What needs to happen in Egypt? You can uh, give an answer in German if you like. Uh, I I don't know. I just I just waiting for more pressure from the uh, opposition in Germany, uh, from the Green from the Green Party, from the Linke Fraktion. More pressure, more real pressure. Uh, I don't see any kind of pressure actually. Oh, it's not enough. Was ist der Grund, warum es nicht genug? What do you think um, is the reason for this lack of pressure? Maybe fight against terrorism or. Um, I mean, can we put it like this? Okay. Um, is this the argument of the German government? Well, I do think that there are several factors that influence our Egypt policy, different interests. It's not only one interest. For example, we do not want to see increasing refugee uh, figures via Egypt. There's also a security cooperation, um, which we're interested in, or more intelligence. Um, 
about potential terrorists in Germany, and some politicians are also interested in the rights of uh, Christians in Egypt, and the politicians here in this country tend to think very often that this might work out well with someone like Sisi, although we have to be fair and admit that this is also something to do that the official representatives of the Christians in Egypt um, put forward this argument in Germany. So there are many different interests that influence the German uh, policy towards Egypt. However, nevertheless, I do think that after 2011, the political decision makers, and in particular in the administration, um, many have realized that this policy will not work out in the long run. It's also a bit problematic. So people or politicians uh, know that um, it's um, uh, how do you come to this conclusion? Well, of course, um, we hear people um, discuss about that. The situation gets worse and worse, so why don't we change our policy? So the question is always the alternatives or lack of alternatives, or people tend to think that there is lack of alternatives. Is there an alternative to al uh, at this moment? Or what would be the alternative? Well, I don't know which Egyptian uh, activist or politician said that recently. However, I think right now any Egyptian might win the elections against Sisi. So, of course, there would be an alternative in free elections. Sisi is not popular. We have to put it uh, like that. In 2014, he was not extremely popular either. However, some people um, trusted him at first, wanted to give him a chance. But I think in the meantime, um, this has gone. And this will be the main problem in the elections in one year from now, even if uh, the elections might be rigged from a German perspective. Uh, it will be quite clear that hardly anyone is going to vote. This will be the clear challenge for the Egyptian administration, um, at least to, to um, try to convey the image of, of free elections. I think many politicians here think that there is no alternative, and uh, Egyptians always considered in relation to the neighboring countries. And so the politicians tend to say, well, it's not nice in Egyptian. However, take a look at Syria, take a look at other countries, whereas the situation is even worse, or even Turkey, or the Sinai Peninsula. Well, this is a part that is usually not considered part of Egypt uh, here uh, in this country. So I'm just trying to find a justification or, uh, or to tell you how the politicians tend to think here. A comment, because he mentioned like two things, like the Geflüchtete uh, problem and the terrorism. And, uh, and. <laughs> And uh, if you if we looked at the numbers of the Geflüchtete, Leute über Ägypten is increased like five times in the last two years. And if we looked at the ter terrorism in Egypt, look at the terrorism before a Sisi and after after a Sisi after the military. And a Sisi himself said before he elected as a president, he said that the solution of the violence was dealing with the situation in Sinai will just bring more terrorism and will bring more enmity between the state and the Islamist. And he did already what he warned of. And so if we uh, if we looked at these two points, it's already deteriorated under a Sisi. Yeah, that's what just wants to comment. So just to add on that, there is, there's a few things that we have to look at. Um, first of all, the the levels of repression in Egypt are unprecedented. Just in this last couple of weeks, 54 news media outlets were blocked from Egypt. There is only a single narrative in Egypt, a single narrative that is a state narrative, and anyone that you know contradicts that narrative is completely what's called. So the situation in Egypt, when you have, I mean, when in 2013 when I got arrested, it was we, we were telling, we were asking, or people were asking, hey, why are you arresting so many people? Now, with the enforced disappearances and extrajudicial killings, I mean, my, my, my aunt's husband was shot nine times after he was tortured and his fingers were cut off. Now we're saying, hey, hey, just arrest people. Just, just let us know where they are. We just want to know where they are. 
The situation in Egypt is, um, it's like a pressure cooker with no outlet. It's bound to blow. It's not a matter of, it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. That's number one. Number two, just back on the radicalization piece. If you look back historically, in the 50s and 60s, those same Torah prisons is the same prisons that the Islamic Jihad movement stemmed from. Those same prisons, those are the same exact prisons. And guess what? They had a lot less numbers inside those prisons, and the conditions were much better back then. So if you looked at just five, ten years down the road, so when we're talking about security, economic, and, 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 uh, and political interests of great nations, I mean, this argument we hear back in Congress, we hear back from the administrations, both in the Obama administration and now, that our security, you know, uh, uh, interests, our political interests, our economic interests. And it's looking, you know, looking down at your feet, you're not looking ahead. Because if you looked ahead, the values, democratic values, are not at odds with interests. And this notion that, uh, um, politicians seem to have it's it's an oversimplified narrative that needs to be countered and needs to be countered extremely hard because guess what the radicalized the fully radicalized people that are inside those prisons are going to be easy distinguishable but it's the half radicalized the people that still feel abandoned by the rest of the world and then they'll eventually get out but they'll still back in there in the back of their heads they'll still have undealt with issues They'll still have, in the way they integrate and assimilate back into societies, back into normal life. Th that's extremely important to look at. And if we're looking at the future of, of, uh, of, of Egypt or of the Middle East, it's after 2011, there's no, there's no really turning back. I mean, you literally, you have people here and in other countries who against all odds, you know, when I did a hearing in Congress in 2015, my father was disappeared from prison, beaten, and his tooth, teeth were broken. But guess what? I'm here today, and I'm still going to be outspoken. Ahmed is here today speaking with all of the threats and all of the risks, and there's hundreds of people, it's not about numbers, who are still believe in the 2011 dream of a free Egypt, of a free and democratic, of people having their own voice. And that is power. So do we get to you know, go out and, 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 uh, and challenge those narratives that we're talking about with politicians? Yes, that's a must. And we have to reach out once, twice, and a hundred times until that narrative is in their heads. But, uh, so, the, I, that, that concept, this, this uh, radicalization, this security, I call it the security-based argument. I mean, I briefed Secretary Kerry before the strategic talks on Egypt when he went to Egypt and he ended up repeating and regurgitating back those same arguments back to the Egyptians. So it's not a flawed argument. We just have to make it, and we have to continue to make it. For, again, for our security. I mean, and just on the last, uh, just to lighten up the mood just a little bit, well, kind of, um, when, we, uh, when we briefed folks at the external service at the EU on the refugee issue uh, and this fear of refugees, and I know that's big here in Germany. Trigger, and, sure. Yeah, it's a buzzword. And the Egyptians understand this. So um, I was told by uh, uh, the, a cabinet member uh, that I was briefing at the external service that when the Egypt got the U UN Security Council seat, so uh, somebody threw a party for the foreign ministers and, uh, and the ambassadors, and the German foreign minister um, spoke up about, you know, publicly in this private meeting about human rights. And Samah Shukri, uh, Egypt's foreign minister, he interrupted him, cut him off, and he said, if you think you have a refugee issues, all we need to do is send 10 million people, and that's a ninth of our population. This is called bully diplomacy, understanding people's fears and playing on that. But, you know, and my sister always makes this example. She's a clinical uh, therapist, and uh, she always makes this, this, uh, this you know, argument that, Listen, it's like a teenage kid, right? Like, he can't live without, like, he can't live without the West. I mean, he gets all of his legitimacy. He gets all of his funding. He gets, he's going to complain and whine, and I don't want to do this, and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, like, you can't give him everything he asks for, right? Like, at the end of the day, there's got to be some discipline. And it's really, really important that we make this point to politicians. Being public, the Egyptians hate it, but being public is extremely important. If for anything, 
it slows down that process of radicalization, that people inside of prison know that there are people out there still speaking about them, that they are not forgotten. That's extremely important. If, if just for that. Ich könnte mir trotzdem vorstellen, dass... Uh well, I could imagine anyway that um, there has to be something inside society in Egypt. Society in Egypt should give a signal to... What do you hear about the people that still live in, in, uh, in Egypt? What do people think about this split in society between the secular and the Islamist sections of the population? Is there a sign of hope that people will reconcile, or is there a disappointment, a re resignation? And what about the spirit of the street, the revolution? Can it come back in the country, inside the country? The people. Well, the question is simple. The answer probably is difficult. Uh, they are full of anger. They are full of desperation. They, uh, I think that like they will move, like in the couple field, coming couple of years maybe. But I, the, I, I feel this when I was in, in Egypt before I came back to Germany. They are so angry. They are uh, disappointed because of the economic state. They, uh, they like now. They are uh, not not before. Like I was in Egypt before in uh, uh, 2014, but the people was like, okay, we know how we have no choice other than a Sisi. So he is better as a Muslim brother. Uh, so we are hoping that he will make everything better. But now they say he is fa his, he failed. He can't do anything. He is not any ho hope anymore. Uh, Dasselbe, was man auch über Morsi gesagt. They said the same about Morsi. To add something about the radical radicalization of the people, because how the uh, police deal with the people in prison, it there's a completely difference between how they deal with us, uh, the secular activists, and mm -hmm. with the Islamists, uh, the Islamists from ES. Uh, Where's the difference? Uh, the difference is that they, they give them what all what they need. They give to him all the rights. They uh, put him in the better places as as uh, as us, because I think they had like uh, some like fear or something of this uh, radical people. And I I saw many of the young people who th they were not Islamist at all. They have nothing to do with politics at all, and they radicalize in in the prison. And I, the problem is that. The management, the managers know that already. Like there was a guy from ES in a cell, and the people were going to him to to learn and to uh, to listen to him, and like they was giving lessons to the people, and they they have all the freedom to do what all they want. Why is it? I, I, I can't understand. I can't give explanation. I just, I, I thought about it and I, so I said, okay, maybe they have a fear because these people may send a message or something to outside and make any, like, I don't know. I can't, I can't understand it. Like, most of the IS people are in El Stibal prison. And this prison is a very, as we said, it's a very open prison. They, uh, they become everything, they, they, they receive everything they want. Like, I, uh, for example, I was in, in Scorpion prison. I had not I had no right to get papers, to get bands, to get uh, box, to get anything. And... Uh, to see your uh, Verlobte? Yeah. It's, it, yeah, it's only uh, yeah. family? This is was like, I, it was, as Muhammad said, I didn't understand what's going on. I, I, I really, they want these people to be radicalized? Are they helping them to be radicalized? What is the point? Another question, eine ganz andere Frage, oder die geht auch in die Richtung. Another question. Maybe it's naive, this question. Why does everyone hate the Muslim Brotherhood? They were the only organization that could have been an alternative to the military state. How can you explain that hatred? Listen, I grew up in I grew up in the United States of America, so I came to Egypt literally three months before uh, the coup. And so I couldn't, I, I had, my dad was in the Morsi government. I had a lot of Your disagreements. Brothers. Yeah, I had a lot of disagreements about how he, they ran things. Um, I, I'm, I'm not affiliated in any way, uh, so I can't really speak to that. Um, I, I, what I can speak to is uh, my experience from prison, what I saw, what I saw from, um, from the Muslim Brotherhood. I was, you know, 
in the same ward as Morsi's son, as Beltagi's son, with Ala Al-Fattah, the secular activists, with Ahmed Maher, the founder of 6th of April. And what I know was, and I was, I had, <laughs> funny enough, I, you know, and the point about Coptic, uh, you know, that CC is better for the Coptic minority. I, I had a, a cop that was with us in that same ward, and it was very interesting because Me too. He, uh, yeah, he, <laughs> he, he was charged with the same charge that I was charged with, was belonging to the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. which is just really weird, you know? Um, Christian. Oh, you are yeah. Muslim brother. <laughs> yeah. um, so it, it's, uh, it's really interesting that what I do know is that there's two camps. There's two camps um, in Egypt. Sisi's narrative tries to paint it as Islamists or, you know, pro-revolution, whatever, or, or, you know, Islamists and non. It's not that. It's people that want change, people that want to have a voice. And in that camp, there are Islamists, there are secular activists, there are Coptic Christians, there are, there are literally from all across the, 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 the spectrum in Egypt. And then you have a anti-revolution, people that just want the same old status quo, they want... and. That also, they have Islamist itself, the entire Salafi camp. Who is can in understand that? Wer soll denn da noch durchstehen? Well, who can still understand such a situation? Uh, apparently, not, uh, not you know, the German uh, administration or the American administration. Hopefully, they uh, get a grasp on that. Soon. Hopefully. <laughs> Was hat die Bundesregierung? What has federal, the Federal Republic of Germany uh, done concretely, except for economic cooperation? What else did they do to support? Well, I think the central problem is that the German government gives sick symbolical recognition. The chancellor went to Egypt and also some federal ministers of Germany uh, traveled to Egypt regularly. That was uh, a very important fact for the SEC administration. Next to, of course, development cooperation that is still going on that was never suspended. There is a big uh, power plant deal. Uh, Siemens, a uh, major German factory, uh, is involved in that very important project for Egypt and builds power plants. Half of the uh, Egyptian population can be supplied with electricity based on the power plants that uh, the Siemens company is going to build. And it would have been impossible to have this power plant deal without the assistance of uh, the German government. And there was another important moment that the German government missed. The Egypt got this major aid package of the International Monetary Fund last year. It was a 12 million US dollar deal, and it helped uh, Egypt to avoid bankruptcy. And that was a very interesting moment, because here the German government was a central actor in providing this aid. We are directly involved in this aid package, 308 US dollars. It doesn't sound much, but we are an important voice in international donor institutions who make this money available. And I think here the German government missed an opportunity to stand up for more political participation, for more human rights, and exert pressure on the government before handing out money. Can we still make up for it? Can we still remedy this? Well, I'm firmly convinced we can do something, because this 12 million, billion uh, US dollar deal will not be the only assistance Egypt needs. Very soon we are going to have another situation where Egypt will have to talk to Germany, to the European Union and the international financial institutions. And Germany has a voice in all these institutions. So we missed one opportunity, but there are more opportunities out there in the future, I'm sure of that. And there we can make assistance conditional I make clear-cut demands to improve human rights situations and allow for political participation. In the security agreement, I think there is some kind of vague formulation saying that human rights must be respected as a kind of sideline. 
Uh, yes, uh, I have criticized this security agreement a great deal. When I talked to federal uh, there's a government, I considered it completely wrong to sign this agreement. But of course, then when cooperation takes place, you can do something step by step. So it does make sense to watch the situation, to observe the projects that the government is going to uh, launch. And so we have to always contact our, our government and say, well, everything you do, every project you do must be based on certain human rights conditions and cooperation with such a system cannot be possible with a state that disregards all of that. Mr. Budner, do you think there is an opportunity to support the Egyptian uh, business, uh, the Egyptian economy, and still work politically? Yes, that's our task. What the German government is not doing is it is never uh, tying its cooperation with Egypt to human rights standards. And this is our demand. It should happen whenever there are bilateral meetings on a high level. It should always be made clear whenever international fora, EU conferences take place. Uh, the Human Rights Council should always have Egypt on its agenda. And we should not be afraid of criticism coming from the officials of, in Egypt. And so whenever there is a practical project, we should look at the human rights situation and also make demands. We still have a number of partners in Egypt. We also have uh, close links with the German embassy in Cairo. And they also observe the situation. They follow, they monitor the situation. And they try to keep up contacts with human rights organizations in as far as they still exist and to create a framework where they can exchange opinions and information. So we still have some level of cooperation, but there is another level that doesn't work at all. The high level meetings, especially, there things go wrong. We have seen that in 2015 when Assisi came to Berlin and met Chancellor Merkel. And there the federal government of Germany did not use that opportunity to push for more human rights. So. We have tried to uh, include human rights uh, demands in the agreement between Egypt and Germany regarding the work of German political foundations in uh, Egypt. But still, uh, the German government didn't make clear-cut demands. And they didn't tell us easy, we can only allow you to come to Berlin if you sign this agreement uh, for political foundations to work. and. Uh, you sign an agreement that focuses on human rights. Assisi is now in Berlin. It's a second a second visit. Is that still on the agenda, this kind of uh, agreement today? He's not here for an official state visit. Uh, are they still negotiating the agreement for the work of political foundations? Uh, no, this negoci negotiation process is over. Of course, we try to put human rights on the agenda, but it's difficult. Merkel's visits to Egypt, there again, they gave legitimacy to Assisi. Merkel went and attended this dinner where Egyptian temple dancers were dancing against the backdrop of the Sphinx, and all of that was filmed uh, by the government and put on the Facebook side of Assisi. There, the German government should have said this is not going to happen. We are not going to provide legitimacy. It shows the German government is rather weak, doesn't negotiate, doesn't use its powers. But still, of course, we know that Merkel talks about human rights when there is a talk, but she doesn't do it as strong as necessary. And still, she gives too much legit legitimacy to Assisi. Let me just add. And I think it's quite appropriate to talk about it here. The agreement on the work of political foundations from Germany in uh, Egypt. It is very easy to criticize uh, the German government. We know that things go wrong at the moment. And I also think that the policy of our government is uh, too feeble, too weak. They don't use their powers. They don't negotiate. Uh, they accept rhetorics 
But as far as this agreement on the work of political foundation is concerned, it is a an agreement where the political foundations could have done more. They could have said, no, we are not going to come if you do not fulfill certain demands. All political foundations, political foundations in Germany, should have made a clear-cut statement. And if some of the foundations wanted to have disagreements, uh, other foundations should have said, no, we are not going to participate. We are not going to go there, because it's an agreement that just accepts the authoritarian state that we have. An authoritarian state that has a repressive NGO legislation. So to put it in a nutshell, uh, Germany is just interested in combating terror and uh, making sure no more refugees come. Yes, that seems to be a priority. But again, it, this agreement for the political foundations is very interesting. Because political foundations, what are they? They are actors, they're civil society actors. And I was quite disappointed that they didn't stand up, that they didn't protest. Let me also add, of course, the federal government is the main political actor. That's for sure. We've got the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Chancellery, Minister of the Interior. And it's very difficult to talk about the security agreements with Egypt. They're quite reluctant to talk about that. And, uh, they, of course, they do not want to talk about how they're going to cooperate with security forces uh, that torture their own people. These are uh, difficult issues that our Ministry uh, of Interior has to come to terms with. Uh, we are talking to the government. We have said we reject the security agreement and we still try to influence the ministries, especially the Ministry of uh, the Interior. But next to the uh, federal government of Germany, we have other political actors like the foundations. Some of them are still present in Egypt. We also have members of parliament in Germany and they could also be active, uh, but they do not focus on human rights criteria at the moment. And we also have private companies that could do more. Uh, of course, they are not legally requ required to do so, but according to their own uh, codes of ethics, they would have to uh, focus also on human rights standards uh, and so legal certainty and what it means for their employees is something that sh they should have a close look at. Thank you for these very critical and open and intimate insights. I am not going to summarize this discussion, but what I would like to do now is uh, finish our talk right here on stage and open uh, for our audience. But before we give our audience the opportunity to talk, uh, would you like here to give us your assessment about uh, the, the, the near future? Uh, if we met here again two years from now, who will be in power in Egypt? What will the German position be? What the situation will be in prisons in two years to come? If I may, I'd like to uh, criticize this picture over there. This is not Egypt. This is the, the the image that Germans have when they think of Egypt. What what kind of picture should we have? You should show people with demonstration posters in their hands. Well, no, no. Uh, it was just, just a criticism. I would have liked to see people uh, in the present. Nee, future. We the future. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you had a crystal ball, what would you say would the situation be like in two years from now? Trying to fight, we will keep... Uh, you personally? For me... Personal uh, life. Till now, I can't live my personal life. I'm still linked to the people in Egypt, still linked to the people in the prison. Because the, la the last match for me in the prison, the people in my cell was, uh, they were trying to make party for me because I'm going out. But uh, they told me that please don't forget us. Please keep fighting for us. And they told me that, and I will never forget this. 
So for me, now, there is no space for my personal life. I know this makes my wife angry, but it's uh, very, very hard to concentrate on my personal life while 60,000 people in prison and uh, hundreds of uh, medical negligence uh, uh, cases, hundreds of tortures cases, forced disappearances. Really, it's a nightmare. And uh, I'm forced to live this till now. To me, the, the future seems um, bleak, um, just being honest. But there's hope. Um, again, if, if I, two years ago, if I, or you know, four years ago, if I told this room that you know, in such a hostile, toxic political environment in Egypt that the son of a Muslim Brotherhood leader um, would be imprisoned and freed, but not just freed, the President of the United States of America would personally intervene on his behalf, that the United States Congress would stipulate $1.3 billion of, uh, 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 of aid, of military aid, on the release of, uh, this every single person in this room would be, you know, in complete disbelief. But guess what? I'm sitting here with you today. Um, my hope stems from you, uh, from people that are interested in uh, in these issues that continue to work with resilience, with persistence, and that gives me hope because, um, and y you know this in prison, in a very very dark room, uh, a uh, a single light illuminates the darkness. Uh, a, a single, uh, what's it called? A single light illuminates the entire darkness. So that, uh, the way we, the way we quantify good and evil is not. Uh, it's it's good is always so much heavier uh, than evil. So, in five, ten years, uh, will you know, people, believers in democracy and freedom prevail. Hell yeah. Bekomme ich auch noch einen kleinen politischen Ausblick? Can I also get a political uh, perspective and outlook? Well, analysts are usually wrong. So what about the symbols here? What would an analyst consider the right symbol for Egypt today? Well, definitely people. I would fully agree to the statement. Um, and right now, largely people with a tied up hands. And um, I think the system that we are seeing right now cannot prevail. Egypt is bankrupt. It is being financed from abroad. And the question of how long this uh, regime can survive is decisive to determine how long the international um, or is highly dependent on how long the international community is supporting this regime. I think Egypt has to spend 40% of its uh, gross domestic product on interest. They simply do not have any money left. And by providing uh, new funds, new credits, or also from the Gulf states, also for political region, uh, reasons, uh, such an authoritarian regime can be sustained for, for years. So. Um, I, I think I'm not really in a position to uh, to take a look at the future and to say how uh, the, um, Egypt might develop or whether the system will prevail in the longer run, not in the long run, but in the longer run. However, it's not sustainable in itself, I would say. Mr. Bittner, you have the final word. Oh, it's really a burden for me. Uh, but I think it's quite a sober one with us. Um, I think it's about um, limiting uh, the the damage. It's about the human rights activists and those people who are in prison that they're not being forgotten uh, in the implementation of the NGO law. It's also about 
possibilities, uh, certain leeway, um, and of course international pressure can achieve that. And it's also about the implementation of international agreements. However, the situation is very um, bad. And what we have to consider, despite our criticism towards the federal government, is that in international comparison, we see that the Foreign Office, the Chancellery, is still very open to human rights questions, which is not really an issue in the United States right now. So uh, here we clearly see that the federal government is our ally, um, which always brings up this topic within the EU as well, whereas other uh, countries such as Greece, for example, or, or Turkey are trying to, to block this uh, topic to restrict discussions about that. So we continue with our work and we try to limit the damage and to put the activists, the imprisoned people high on the agenda. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the four of you. And what we can rarely see on the tally uh, and in Egypt as well. So are there any questions? You can raise them in any language. The young man in the front. Uh, wait a second. There will be a, a microphone soon. My name is Islam. I'm an Egyptian student. I've been here for two years. My question is to the whole panel. Uh, it regards to Human Rights Watch. So my, what I understood from the whole thing regarding Human Rights Watch is that there are concerns from Human Rights Watch in, inside the German government and everything. So is there kind of a red line that if the government crossed, then you would be something should be done? Because as, as far as I know, two years ago, um, did anyone hear the last sentence? Okay, so uh, three days ago, uh, six students, uh, uni students from my original uni, uh, were sent to execution. Uh, it's bogus. It's a bogus case, completely bogus case. And I was asking, I was wondering if there is anything we can do, and if there, if this is somehow a red line that we sh shouldn't be crossed. Who would like to answer? Well, we've. Can I speak German? Okay. Well. We have closely monitored and documented this uh, case today and also yesterday with the press release. We've also documented how we gathered the information and we talked um, together with relatives and uh, we talked about the kidnappings um, and uh, the whole process, the mock process also, that military court is sentencing civilists with hardly any access to lawyers. This is something that we've all documented. We are still uh, on this, working on this case. However, we are a civil society organization, so our only option is to uh, document um, issues, to research issues, and to bring this into the political process. And of course, next to the political um, discussions, we can also use the media, social media, and also television, of course. This is a way to exert some pressure on the federal government and also other governments, Western governments. However, beyond that, uh, we are limited, our means are limited. Um, we have to say that quite clearly. We can document, we can raise awareness, we can use media, we uh, can try to find uh, the direct access, direct contact to the politicians, which you do uh, get. Um, however, uh, everything else is part of the executive and also part of the uh, parliament. And, uh, for example, companies would be in a better position if you, for example, uh, are uh, talking to companies uh, about the six students, what about them? So mm, this might also be a way to exert a, a greater pressure. Well, political red line, well, I'm always very skeptical about red lines because they uh, violated too many times. And in Egypt, when there was Rabah, a massacre, I think everyone in Germany and in political uh, Berlin agree that this was mass murder that took place within a day. 150 people were 
killed, or maybe even more than thousand. We don't know because there is n not really um, any. Uh, investigation going on and uh, not even the German ambassador was withdrawn. So if before, Roman, you would have asked me, then I would have said, well, this might be, this would be a red line and there will be sanctions and the ambassador will be withdrawn from the country. However, this did not happen. And so this is the, the danger about that. This is the risk that um, we see worse and worse violations and there isn't really a red line for it. So um, well, I think uh, you mentioned a main uh, point here. Everyone needs to be clear about that. As um, bad as the system might be right now, there are possibilities to exert pressure. There are only a few executions compared to the number of death sentences that were uh, made. So if we would exert more pressure, we would achieve more. Um, like their Human Rights Watch and other organizations, they research, they make sure that these reports come out, that they're well documented. Um, honestly, it's on every single one of us um, to go out and use this, you know, verified, well documented information to figure out where the soft powers, where can we exert pressure, wh whether it's within the civil society space, whether it's within government, whether it's within the parliament. Whether it's in the judiciary, honestly, for, I mean, I'm, I'm, I was shot in Rabah uh, in my arm. Until today, what, 2013 till now, almost four years later, there has not been a single legal case outside of Egypt for any human rights violators. The, the, the legal arm has not been activated in any country. country Germany, the US, France, the UK, has been used sometimes to threaten that we're going to sue. But actual legal, you know, uh, 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 really well, you know, put together legal cases have not been used. That can then empower civil society. That can then empower, then you can go to a human rights watch or a think tank or and say, hey, can you help us, you know, get you know, get this legal case going. Can you help us? So then you pressure because sometimes, because government is not all the same, and this is what I've uh, I've seen in briefings. Some within government there are splits. There are different power struggles, or there are different views on certain issues. So sometimes you have to find where your allies are, so that then and then give them the tools so that internally they are able to then make a better case for their point of view that aligns itself with you. So we just have to be a little bit more politically savvy. Uh, Yeah, I think so. uh, this is, I just want to say something. I think your question was what uh, the, road li the red line for the uh, German, uh, not for Human Rights Watch, of course. He, yeah, he mean for for the for the for the German government. What was the German government? Also, what is the red line? Uh, and I think there is no red line because there is no morals in politics. And uh, I, I am a street activist, and let me talk to you with the street language. Nobody will help us. We are just believe in the people, in people in the street. And also we believe in the people in the street here in Germany, not in the governments. Sorry, uh, just to follow up on that, this is what I've been doing, uh, you're saying as a private citizen, I've been, this is what I've been doing and dedicated my entire, my entire two years since I've been out of prison to. Uh, like, like we all do this, we are activists, that's what we are okay. doing. And please encourage him. He is allowed to do that yeah, too. Of course, <laughs> of course, you are allowed. You're not in Egypt. You are welcome. Man. You're not in Egypt. <laughs> but what? What would? What? What would we get from doing that? This is a question. Dame in the second row, please. Lady in the second row, please. Well, I didn't know. Uh, as many details, but uh, it made me really sad when I heard what you uh, told us about the NGO law. And I'm politically active here in Berlin, and I can not understand that uh, those who have a clear task and agreed to such uh, an agreement, and then we hear that the government 
is on our side. This was uh, is one argument. But on the other hand, in the at the international level, we see that um, nothing's brought on the agenda. So uh, for how much? longer are we supposed to watch uh, the situation um, i can not understand that uh, we agree to such an agreement i'm sorry well i don't think that there's uh, there's anybody uh, who does not agree with you as really Really, I don't understand what the gains, what the German government gains from this. I don't understand. He he can't help them with the uh, immigration. He can't help them with terrorists. He can do nothing. And so I don't know what they gain. I understand the government, but I don't understand the NGOs. So so uh, it's it's really important to 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 note the timing of when this NGO law was prepared and cooked up in the Egyptian parliament. Das lag schon sechs Monate, right? If I so this had been prepared for six months. Passed, Tell us why. And it was passed four or five days after the United States of America elected Trump. Yeah, which, which then, again, just brings me back to a point that was made earlier, which puts a bigger responsibility on, you know, the German administration and the chancellery as, you know, hopefully the leader of the free world now to take initiative and not just follow. Was soll denn Merkel noch alles klären? What is Merkel uh, supposed to, what else is Merkel supposed to do? Being against the, uh, this agreement, they gave a statement, of a statement, it was very nice actually, and also amnesty, but, <laughs> what <laughs> Kann es sein, dass Sie zuerst sich schon ganz lange melden? Did you want to make a contribution for quite some time now? In the first row here? Okay. Islam? Hi. Here. Um, I'm like in a kind of similar position. He's David. I'm David, yes. Um, in kind Who of is similar David? Um, One sentence. Who I'm? I'm, I'm a good Mensch. <laughs> <laughs> I was uh, actually I was uh, I have a structure political organization what you want to call it and we actually I think I, w I want to actually just um, say yes to what Ahmed said we cannot um, rely on governments we can rely on ourselves and we can actually hope that there are other people who, who actually have the same um, state of mind and that's what what can help us and we can do this and no one else this all this bullshit about human rights etc it's promotion it's <laughs> bullshit it's fuck this we with with our organization we we like we s collected money for Tahrir Square we made solidarity videos um, for 2009 in Iran you know who was the first guy who was who was in Iran after the atomic compromise was um, negotiated Sigma Gabriel. He was paying his dues for Ayatollah Khamenei in Iran. Who was with Abdel Fattah um, at Sisi? It was Sigma Gabriel. Siemens, yeah. one big company, they made a huge deal with Iran, giving, um, giving and with Egypt and so on, so on. Fuck all those people talking about human rights. Fuck them. It's bullshit. Uh, it's we can only rely on ourselves. And we connect later. Sorry. We can do a lot, actually. But we cannot rely on, on anyone I, else but ourselves. I will just want to add something. But no bullshit. No anymore. bullshit. <laughs> but I like bu saying bullshit. Uh, so we don't ask for help because we're trying to do a revolution. So we're asking for solidarity from everybody, all the world. And uh, about the, this, uh, sorry, bullshit of the human rights things, it helped in personal cases. I, I am an example. I am an example, got helped by, by the human rights uh, activities and support and so. So it would help in just single, uh, maybe also Muhammad got helped with this, but not as uh, like in the major number of the people in the prison, it would not help. It would not change our regime. It's our regime. We are responsible to change it. So, sorry, I'm, I'm just going to comment just really quickly. Uh, um, 
I, when I was in prison, I did not believe in governmental institutions and, in, you know, in, uh, as a path to change. I have a little bit of a different view, not contradicting anything that was said. First and foremost is the people. We have to mobilize the people that believe in democratic values and principles. We have to. But we have to also recognize that these governmental institutions, these change mechanisms that are in free and democratic societies work when people mobilize. So they're not mutually exclusive, okay? So that the government, the current institutions can be changed. Again, we are living proof of that, okay? But how do we get that to then change the status quo is then we mobilize people to force the governments to act. And that's, I think we have to make that distinction so that we're not, um, you know, so we're, we're, when we're talking, we're, we're, we understand the political landscape. We understand that when we're sitting across from governments, what we're asking. Um, and I think, you know, just a little bit different from uh, Dr. Ahmed, I think that it can snowball. That first, it was, you know, one case, now it's two cases, now we're talking, you know, there, there is, even with Trump, we got Aya Higazi out. That was a big deal. So, no, we can happen. We have to be politically savvy in utilizing the mobilization that we have with the people, but then use that as leverage to then pressure governments to act. That's, that's just my, my comment. Well, the um, uh, man in the back, please. Um, I actually live in Egypt, and uh, I'm here on a visit on Ledger, and... Uh, Actually, maybe even commenting here compromises me, just making a comment. But um, I can tell that the situation there is as they described, and I have a good pulse of what's happening um, in the street. And I write a lot about um, Egypt. Um, I'm also Coptic, but that doesn't protect me from being in prison because the situation, uh, both in terms of uh, for Copts and the radicalization, is so much worse, and all the rhetoric that governments are talking about, about refugees, terrorism, cops, I can definitely say it's false. And it's hiding behind uh, something else. And um, I have a suggestion, how about talking about um, Germany's involvement, not in the same passive tone as like, well, they should have exerted um, uh, pressure, but they didn't, we don't know what to do, they're trying to help. And that's very passive because I think they're partners in whatever Egypt is doing. And if you think it's a great thing, then they're partners in a great thing. If you think it's a crime, it's a, they're partners in crime. And the new agreement, when it comes to the police, they are going to be helping crush dissent when the Egyptian police does it. And they're going to get German help. And that is not just a passive role. Signing an agreement and giving international recognition is a partnership. I can also say that um, uh, German diplomacy isn't just uh, observing. In 2012, I wrote an investigative report about Ghouta censoring articles on behalf of the military. And uh, at the same time, there was a, a, a conference with Ala Abdel Fattah that the German ambassador interfered to cancel because of relationships with the military. And here we have these uh, economic interests uh, that are really the driving force uh, we can't just shrug and say, why are they doing that? It's not working. No, there are economic interests there. So uh, Germany has uh, helped with the license plates in Egypt. Germany has helped with the passports in Egypt. There's a lot of dubious dealings uh, from uh, uh, liaisons of the German industry, uh, military. I mean, you were talking about economics. Why does Egypt need a submarine? Okay. There's a lot, a lot of things going on on the economic front. And to deal with Germany is just being, oh, we don't know, but maybe... I think my suggestion would be to deal with it as partners in whatever is happening there. And in a democratic society, um, I think Egyptians can't object to that. But I think Germans have the responsibility to object to these uh, fascist uh, activities and not pretend that they're just uh, a passive role. I'm not singling out Germany. We're here in Germany. All countries are the same. but. Germany is uh, a very strong country and therefore has more responsibility. Any, anyone who wants to comment on this? Gerne. Okay. 
Ich finde es also, wenn es keine äh, rote If there is no red line, and if there are things we didn't do in the past and we would do again, then I think what we are talking about is the security of Germany and Europe. And we are talking also at the same time about economic uh, interests. But we are never talking about uh, human rights. We've been hearing it for years and years. Who is, could you tell us who you are? I mean, who are you? I live in Germany. I work here. I'm a German citizen. And I make a contribution to this country. I identify with this country, with Germany. But what I hear is a repetition of the same old things all the time. I get information saying, well, we have interests, we have interests. Politics is an ugly thing if it's just about interests. The people in Egypt, when they stood up, they did it on their own. They did not get much support from outside. So there was no support for those who wanted to improve the situation. There's still no support coming. And of course, it's good to have a discussion about it. It is, of course, good to have these panel discussions and listen to the stories and get information. But, you know, of course, I do believe that there is hope. But what could be the future for in the next 30 years? I mean, there are some dictators who have been in power for 30 years with the support of the West and the United States. I'm not a fundamentalist, but I say, when do we finally stop just talking and start doing something? When do we finally make clear-cut demands and insist on their fulfillment? We always talk about cooperation and interests. Yes, we do know Germany has interests in uh, e Egypt and the Middle East. America has interests there. Europe has interests there. but. Human rights don't seem to have a proper role in politics. And there was never a focus on human rights in the meetings between uh, Merkel and Assisi. They didn't insist on the human rights situation in order to improve uh, the improvement. I mean, we have no politicians here since you're making a demand towards uh, the politicians. Do you have a question? Uh, well, there are some people who have an influence on politics here, so. Uh, I didn't. What's your name, Ibrahim? Ibrahim, this is what we are. This is a problem, and this is what we are trying to change. Vielleicht, vielleicht eine Bemerkung auch zu dem was. Let me also make a remark. Human rights advocacy is a right in itself. You do not have to give a reason why you want human rights to be fulfilled. If, but if you try to influence foreign policy, it's not enough to just go and tell politicians you have to uh, stand up for human rights just for the sake of human rights. It's important to tell political decision makers if you don't do it, if you do not insist on human rights, it will not only have consequences for Egyptians and Egypt, it will have consequences for us. And these consequences are obvious. Radicalization, that's a central central things. If we allow systematic violations of uh, human rights, we will have a radicalization of people in Egyptian prisons. So we cannot say we don't care about the human rights in Egypt. We cannot be indifferent because it will have repercussions on all of us. And so we need to insist on that as well. The gentleman over there. Um, my name is uh, Gülşen Iburak. I'm a dissident from Turkey, self-imposed exile, not not conditions like you guys said. But obviously our countries are being run by lunatics, so I believe we have something in common here. And uh, I've been there where you have been. I've been also talking in uh, panels. And especially after the failed military coup, we have been always paranoid with my friends that the Turkish Secret Services have their hands stretched out here in Germany and that they are documenting us, writing our thoughts down. 
I'm curious if you guys have the same feeling when you're going around here that some Egyptian uh, embassy personnel is just walking in as if they own the whole place and sitting down and writing stuff about you. We have we have we have an example of uh, journalist Ismail Iskandarani, who um, was practically snitched on by the ambassador, the Egyptian ambassador here. And then when he went to Egypt, he was imprisoned, and he continues to be in prison. Um, so yes, uh, again, when I did my hearing in Congress, my father, two days before, was disappeared, beaten, his t tooth were broken. Um, so yeah, m m most definitely. Is that going to stop us? No. For me, I'm living here in Berlin, and uh, the security service in Berlin is very active, the Egyptian. And there's like five guys are working in the embassy. We know them. Do you see one of them here? No. <laughs> and <laughs> I know him very well. And uh, before I went to Egypt last time, I, someone asked it to meet me, and he said that he is a revolutionary, and he is like pro-revolution, blah, blah, blah. And I met him and discovered that he was recording, actually, for me. So I'm completely paranoid all the time. Oh, what did you hear about your father? When did you hear about your father uh, last time? Do you know what his uh, situation is now? Most recently, his situation has gotten better. Um, only because I haven't been uh, as uh, outspoken, strategically done, not out of fear. <laughs> so, yeah. Ich wollte was fragen. I wanted to ask a question regarding radicalization in Egypt and the future of Egypt. I have a very good friend who lives in Berlin. He is also a refugee from Egypt, and uh, he's hoping to get political asylum, but his case is very difficult. And he says that this situation that people radicalize because they lose faith in the West is very bad. And we have talked about, you might, they would, probably people today would elect anyone except Assisi. And that also uh, harbors the danger that uh, some extremists might come to power. Do you see this danger too? Um, the radicalization, this is, this is at the core of, uh, you know, kind of just going off of what was being said, it's at the core of the issues that we talk about when, when it comes down to human rights, as human rights is not just as uh, a value or out of principle, but out of interest that, um, and, and you know, this, this is the argument that, again, this will come back and not just with the refugee issue, but the, 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 the radicalization and th this, I don't know how to explain it, not only has the repressive measures that the CC regime taken make a very fertile ground for radicalization, but there has been a fostering of. Um, I, I think actually Wael had mentioned this on Twitter. Uh, it was really interesting. There's at some point a state security officer uh, in these corruption charges, judicial uh, investigations, this state security officer got a two million pound bonus for combating extremism, and what noted very, uh, you know, in a very witty way, why would someone continue? Why would one? Why would someone want extremism to end if they're getting a two million pound bonus, you know, every year? So it, it's really, uh, you know, to just to just think about that and to continue to to correct that narrative I think is extremely important and I think will help with the individual cases and then overall with time, um, you know, that that will contribute to some sort of change. Um, I've got a different remark. You know, what I consider dramatic is the fact that more and more people radicalize 
and that indeed the administration can use this radicalization to say, hey, we have to be more uh, repressive, we need more assistance, we need more security cooperation, because you in the West are interested in combating uh, the IS structures. And this is how the situation on Sinai works. It's good for a country to have a bit of IS and uh, radicals uh, because that gives you a good reason to ask for more money and more support from the West. And the West uh, readily falls into that trap. The Western government really uh, obey. Page out of uh, Bashar al-Assad's book early in the you know, it's called e series are much more complicated situation, but. It's, hey, let all the crazies out of prison and let them establish IS, and then we'll have to fight them. So it's a page out of their book. They're just doing it. Uh, they're, mo they're, they're doing it more, more uh, smart, I think. May I, I just, I want to add some, just one line. But all dictatorships in the history had some, like, uh, something to make the people afraid of. And they they have now in in Egypt it's sorry, in Egypt <laughs> it's IS. <laughs> it's the boogeyman. <laughs> so who is the next? Um, but you don't see it like a, as a yeah. real threat, ISIS, in like becoming big in Egypt. It most definitely is. Okay, a that's what I mean. But, the but remedy, they are helping that. But, but yeah, they're not. They're they're fostering it. They're they're helping it grow, and they are not the remedy to it. They're using it as a boogeyman, and all of the assistance that they're getting, they're reallocating those funds to cracking down on political dissent rather than effectively combating extremism. They're not. They're fostering it. They need it as a boogeyman to then further consolidate power. There's, there's a very, uh, like, I have an example of a story, a very, sto small, a very short story. I had met a guy in the prison. He was 17 years old. And he told me that he had uh, been tortured, he has been tortured by a police officer. And then he kept him in the dog house for 15 days. And then when he went out, he couldn't like stand. Or, and he was telling me that he dreaming, he dreaming every night to go out and kill this police officer. And I really, I had nothing to, te to, to, to tell him, nothing to say to him. What could I tell someone like this? Yeah, but Dann, uh, die, uh, Frage stellt sich hier. Thank you, Mohammed and Ahmed. Thanks for all the things you told us. L allow me to speak in English. Uh, the, uh, Mohammed Fazer was my uh, professor at the university. I support him in a way because um, I know he uh, belongs to Muslim Brotherhood. I have a problem with Muslim Brotherhood, ideological and political, but I, I like him and support him because he is a great man, really, he is a great man. And uh, the question just now about the radicalization and recruitment inside prisons and hear about the future of Coptic minority in Egypt, because I think so the Egyptian society facing the same uh, question since the revolution of 1919 until today without concrete solution. And the questions are, um, uh, ask the questions are uh, um, nationalism, and it is uh, manifestations uh, and uh, economic uh, uh, interest and uh, the situation toward uh, minorities in Egypt and uh, the Islamic renew. And I think so why the people, they don't like the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. And uh, just now in my work, because I'm a PhD student and uh, about my work, uh, on uh, the uh, history of uh, Jewish minority in Egypt, and the impact of radicalization and uh, recruitment on the structure of society and on the future of the Coptic minority. And I think so that the Coptic minority just now, they facing the same fate of uh, uh, Jewish minority, how we can protect them. Because I think so the Egyptian society, due to uh, systematically persecution and after the massacre of Maspiro and Rabah al Adawiya, it couldn't stand up to protect itself. How we ca how we um, uh, can protect our uh, historical dimension in Egypt, cultural dimension in Egypt, in Egypt, diversity in Egypt, 
which rule uh, that Germany and the activists in Egypt, I know I'm an I'm, I'm activist also, and I live in exile in a way, but the question here, how we can do that? Thank you. Freedom. It's, it's very simple. Freedom comes first. Freedom is a prerequisite to uh, everything you mentioned. It's once you have a free environment, then you are able to protect the rights of minorities. You are able to uh, put in place when there is a rule of law rather than rule by law. Then you're able to uh, then you're able to enforce, not just write a constitution that looks good, um, but you're actually able to enforce once you have the mechanisms. All of that freedom is a prerequisite to that, uh, and this is I think this is a common denominator that most uh, people who have um, experienced or lived in free societies can agree on. Uh, Hannah Arndt had uh, has uh, defined the revolution like with uh, in two parts: Befreiung and then Freiheit. Befreiung comes erst mal, and uh, this is the first step for us to get free from this regime who prevent us from develop. And uh, I think the January uprising answered the question from the beginning. It's freedom, justice, and equality. Thank you. Yeah, I know, I know you are, you are Yeah, yeah. The vision, you need first of all to get right of the wall that prevents you from going forward. You, any, any effort you will go in developing the country so, socially or economically or even how or what, you will not go, we were not able to go forward because you have a wall controlling everything. And the first step in any way of a change or developing or any, it's to get right, to get rid of this wall. Is it Viertel von Neun? I see, doch, I see, noch einer. I would say that is the last frage. We will allow one more last question. Now I have a very bad conscience for two reasons. Bad conscience because I will be the last question. Uh, you're not from Egypt. No, I am not. Uh, where are you from? Yes, I come from Austria. But my question comes from the perspective of uh, Politology. What are the structural differences of uh, the current regime? If you had a revolution, if you won the revolution, what would you change? Of course, it's a it's a very comprehensive question, but it's worthwhile talking about that vision. What would you change? And what is the reason why Egypt is in such a bad situation to date. It's, it's, it's such a wonderful country with so many opportunities. Why is uh, Egypt in such a bad shape at the moment? Well, it's uh, the overarching question for our whole discussion. I do not know whether we can come up with a short answer. A central structural problem is the omni presence and omnipotence of the military of the armed forces. The armed forces are a central actor everywhere in all fields of politics and uh, society, and they implement their own interests. And they try to prevent any change that would conflict in conflict with their own interests. Mohammed has said we need to be very smart in the way we deal with this regime. On the one hand side, of course, there is the grassroots m movement that we can support, that you have to stand up against the wall, as uh, Mohammed said. And we also have more and more tensions in the political elite, elites. That wouldn't mean the uh, whole system would implode tomorrow, but we also see sad dissatisfaction among the elites. 
as far as I can see, the elite is dissatisfied because they cannot guarantee a, the development of sustainable networks. As you see, changes uh, leading um, elite members all the time. And so I think also the elite might be a trigger for change. Mohammed, of course, is right that we should look at those actors in societies that are still there, and uh, especially those uh, actors amongst the elites that could also give an impulse or trigger change. I think this is a very uh, good final statement. We have addressed many issues, and I'm quite happy about that. But of course, uh, it is never possible to answer all questions. And it's ultimately up to Egypt to do something, and it's also up to the world politics to do something. Thanks for these wonderful guests on our panel tonight.